to start, uh, I should tell you that I'm going to talk about Tasmania, but I don't actually live here. I was, however, born here, uh, raised here. Uh, I went to school here. I sung in a choir here. I, uh, I spent my awkward teenage years here. And uh, I also went to, to university here. But then I had to leave to find work. Now that was back in 2003 when the state's unemployment rate was 8.8%. The economy was growing by about 2.5% uh, a year. And nearly 3,500 people uh, had actually made Tasmania their home in the previous 12 months. Ten years later, I'm still living on the mainland. Look, it's, it's, it's worked out pretty well. I've, um, I've built a career in, in urban planning and, and regional development. Uh, I've done a couple more things at university, but I'm ready to come home and raise my family. Easier said than done, however, when the unemployment rate is around 8%, the state's economy is stagnating, and uh, the size of the state's population is actually going backwards. But there's something these numbers don't show, and it's, it's the darkness that seems to have settled across the state. I still get back here a fair bit for work and to visit friends and, and family. And many of the people that I talk to are, are worried. They're uncertain about the future. They're less hopeful about the opportunities Tasmania can provide them and their children. So how do we turn this around? How do we restore a sense of hope? How do we build a more prosperous future? Tasmania. Well, I've got an idea and today I'd like to share it with you. My idea came to me on the 28th of November 2012, last year. Uh, I was on the way to work, sitting on the bus scrolling through uh, Twitter, and uh, I stumbled across this tweet. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change, Charles Darwin. This tweet got me thinking about the challenges facing our, our beautiful island state and, and how we can build a more prosperous, prosperous future for it. Now, Charles Darwin, he was a naturalist. And his evolutionary theories applied to plants and animals. But what if we extend his theory to society and the economy? And more specifically, what if we extend it to Tasmania's society and economy? Let's take another look at this tweet, and instead of thinking about dinosaurs and dodos, let's think about Tasmania. Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survive. Well, I reckon that suits us. Tasmania is a small island state at the foot of the world. Sure, we've got our strengths, but we're never going to be an economic powerhouse. We don't have the vast mineral resources of, say, Western Australia, nor do we have the, the population size uh, and growth of, of New South Wales or Victoria. Darwin then said, it's not the most intelligent of the species that survives. Well, that's fine too, because Tasmania's always going to lose many of its bright young minds to higher paying jobs on the mainland and, and overseas. Darwin believed it was the one most responsive to change that survives. Well, if that's the case, how responsive to change are Tasmanians? Well, before European settlement, uh, the island's inhabitants were highly responsive to change. They were highly adaptive. After the last ice age, when the oceans rose, cutting off Tasmania from the mainland, the state's flora, fauna and indigenous people adapted to the change being imposed on them and thrived, each in their own way. Think about some of the unique species that evolved here in the state, so the devils and the tigers, and even things like hue and pine. After European settlement, however, the state's human inhabitants were more inclined to change their environment than adapt to it. Over 200 years, we, we dammed and logged a, a pristine wilderness to build an economy that was based on cheap energy and resources. 
Now this worked well for, for quite some time, uh, generating wealth and, and plenty of jobs, but then the world changed. It became more connected and competitive thanks to globalization. And unfortunately, Tasmanians were, were slow to respond to this change. We failed to adapt. And we failed to adapt because many of the decisions we'd made in the past had actually made it harder for us to adapt. Our economy was based on a, on a narrow bunch of industries that were making many things that the customers around the world either didn't want anymore or they could get ch uh, elsewhere cheaper. And one by one, many of our traditional industries failed. And to make matters worse, much of our workforce lacked the skills needed to transition into new jobs. Now, there's no better example of this than the state's forestry industry. It's failure to adapt to changing consumer preferences, increased competition, and a growing environmental awareness amongst the community has seen the industry shed half its jobs since 2006 and lurch from one crisis to another. Look, to be fair, uh, some industries in the state have shown a greater capacity to adapt to change than others. The state's energy sector, for example, has successfully diversified from hydro into wind and is forecast to produce nearly a quarter of the country's renewable energy in coming years. Likewise, uh, the state's dairy industry has drawn on uh, technology and, and emerging markets uh, to increase production by nearly 40% over the last decade. There's other examples of, of adaption too, but it's not common enough. It's not the norm. And that's why Tasmania has the country's highest unemployment rate and some of the lowest levels of health, education and income. Now, I believe Tasmania's current predicament is due to our failure to adapt. And for me, the message is clear. We must learn to adapt and embrace change or be content to never fully realise our potential. So that's where we're at. Now I'd like to take a moment to share with you my vision for Tasmania, where I believe we can be. In my vision, the state's people and businesses are thriving in a highly connected and competitive world. We've developed the ability to recognise change and we have the willingness to embrace it. What's more, we also have the skills and the capacity to make the most of the opportunities arising from change. Our people are skilled, creative and resourceful. Our businesses are nimble and they're con constantly reinventing themselves to produce things that are in high demand and attract a premium price. So that's my vision for the state. But how do we break the status quo to get to this place? How do we get better at adapting? How do we build our adaptive capacity? Well, we do it by building these five forms of capital. Natural, human, financial, physical and social. Now for those of you who may be wondering, uh, another way of thinking about capital is assets. So these five forms of assets, uh, of capital, sorry, could also be seen as, far as five forms of assets. All right, let's start with natural capital. Natural capital is the planet's assets. So it's the earth, uh, the air, the water, it's the flora and it's the fauna. It makes all human life possible and underpins all economic activity. I'll tell you three uh, very simple but important things about natural capital. First up, uh, the way humans use it and value it is always changing. Secondly, the more we use now, the less we'll have in the future. And finally, by depleting our natural capital, we actually reduce our ability to respond to change. So what do I mean by all that? Well, 50 years ago, natural capital was pretty much seen as an input, a commodity that fueled other economic activity. It would have been inconceivable that nature-based tourism would contribute $23 billion to the Australian economy each year. Had we allowed Tasmania's economy to be irreversibly damaged, we wouldn't have attracted nearly a million people to our uh, island last year, or the $1.5 billion they injected into our economy. 
nor would we uh, be able to market our clean green image, which we all know is a key ingredient to our future prosperity. So that's why we need to make sure that we renew the natural capital we use and think long and hard about depleting that natural capital which can't be renewed. The second form of capital which influences our ability to adapt is human capital. Human capital is the, the, the skills and knowledge and experience of our people and our businesses. You know, lately there's, um, there's been a lot of talk about the, the, Asian, uh, the, the opportunities arising from the Asian century, but the extent to which Tasmania can actually benefit from the Asian century is wholly dependent on whether our workforce is up to the challenge. And that's because the jobs of today and tomorrow aren't anything like the ones of Tasmania's past. Jobs requiring uh, minimal formal education were once plentiful in the state, but not anymore. An unstoppable transition is underway where, where jobs are increasingly requiring more brains and less brawn. Unfortunately, too many Tasmanians have been too slow to respond to this change. As I'm sure you're aware, the state has some of the country's lowest levels of education participation and attainment. Now, this represents a major barrier to building a more prosperous future for the state. And that's because a highly skilled and educated workforce is better able to adapt to change and transition into the new jobs it creates. Human capital is also essential for innovation and the absorption of ideas from around the world into our economy. I guess my takeaway message when it comes to human capital is this. We cannot expect to thrive and prosper in an increasingly competitive world without a greater investment into human capital from government, businesses, the workforce, and even parents. The third form of capital which influences our ability to adapt is financial capital, or money. You can have all the, the, the natural and human, human capital in the world, but it takes money to start a business or change an existing one. Likewise, uh, it can be difficult for people to take time out to improve their skills and their education when they've got a family to support and bills to pay. Now, people and businesses, they can get their money from three different places. They can use their own money, their savings, they can borrow it, or they can be given it. Now, in tough times like Tasmania is facing now, many don't have much in the way of savings, and, and getting a loan can be incredibly hard. So people may want to adapt, but they haven't got the financial capacity to do so. This is where government can help by providing subsidised education, financial uh, incentives, assistance and, uh, and grants. And I guess a recent example of that is the $100 million in federal funding associated with the Tasmanian Forestry Agreement. But you know what? You can have too much of a good thing and, and government support's no different. Too much government support creates uh, can create a culture of dependency where government is expected to fix many of the problems that are best fixed by people and businesses themselves. Now I believe Tasmania has allowed itself to slip into a zone of dependency and unless this is overcome the state's future is destined to reflect its past. Sure, government's got a role to play but only Tasmania's people and businesses can build a more prosperous future for the state that is lasting. Government can and should, however, play a bigger role in building the state's physical capital, which happens to be the fourth form of capital which influences our ability to adapt. So physical capital uh, is the manufactured or, or man-made assets that underpin economic activity and, and growth. So for businesses, it's things like uh, buildings and machinery and, and vehicles. And for government, it's, it's also things like roads, rail, ports and, and even broadband. High quality infrastructure and physical capital is essential for businesses to quickly and cost effectively uh, adapt to change and make the most of the opportunities arising from it. The fifth and final form of capital which influences our ability to adapt is social capital. Now social capital, it's, uh, it's got many different definitions but I'll define it as the shared values and norms and understandings that facilitate cooperation in Tasmania. Now, I've left it to last because I don't believe any of the other forms of capital matter unless we can collectively recognise our weaknesses in the state and then act together 
to overcome them. This means uh, elevating the value placed on education in Tasmania. Uh, it means celebrating success. It means fostering a culture of creativity and self-sufficiency. Now, to finish up, I want to leave you with this. Tasmania is once again facing challenging times and uh, globalization, a high Australian dollar, and other factors outside our control are fueling a sense of hopelessness about Tasmania's future. Well, my message is it doesn't have to be this way. Charles Darwin said, it's the one most responsive to change that survives. So that's what we must do in Tasmania. We must learn to adapt, we must get better at it, and we must build our adaptive capacity. This means, this means looking after our environment, improving education levels, managing our, our finances well, and providing world-class infrastructure. It means building a strong, self-sufficient state that is willing to, to embrace change. And if we do these things, then we will build our adaptive capacity, we will become masters of change, and yes, we will build a more prosperous future for Tasmania. Thank you very much.